an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Dr. John MacArthur said the book of Galatians is like a flashing sword in a great swordsman's hand whose heart is on fire to defend something. I think that's a pretty appropriate description of Galatians for us. In this letter, Paul is indeed on a passionately defensive mode and for good reason because he's defending two things, two things. He's defending the gospel which has fallen under attack and Paul is defending, really, the people whom, whom, whom Paul had brought the gospel message. He knows that they are under attack because of the false gospel that is being propagated. But Paul is also going to go on the offensive. And on the offensive, he is going to go out against those false teachers in this letter. These false teachers who are presenting a false gospel. Paul is really, really serious about this matter. Now, we learned in previous weeks that Paul's letter is addressed to various churches in the region. We have to understand, unlike his other epistles where he's writing to a specific church, he's writing to a group of churches throughout the region known as Galatia. And today, what is Turkey? And that day, Asia Minor. It was in this region that he had planted several churches, and he had gone on at least three missionary journeys to, vit, to plant and then visit these churches. Paul loved his converts, but he loved not only the fact that they came to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, but he loved the fact that they would grow in their knowledge and in their relationship together with him. Paul wanted to see them grow spiritually. And anything that would come in and disrupt that spiritual growth was problematic for Paul. Now today we want to focus on verses 3 through 5. We've, we've done an intense focus on verses 1 and 2. We want to focus on verses 3 and 5 today. And in verses 3 and 5, we can really outline our study for today in this way. We see from Paul a familiar greeting. We see also from Paul an emphasis on the present evil age. And we also see from Paul a way out, God's deliverance from it. Hence the title for today, Deliver Us. So let's take first this familiar greeting. Paul says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of God our God and Father. So we see a genuine greeting. And notice that there is no commendation in the greeting. It's a greeting. No word of affirmation or encouragement. And um, it's just a greeting. And then Paul is going to get right to his point. But don't misunderstand Paul. He's writing to a group of churches who are under attack. And in the midst of their attack, Many people within those churches have succumbed. He could have given commendation to some people. He could have said something, but Paul doesn't have time for that. He's going to get right to the point. Now, in all of his other letters, he wrote 13 letters in the New Testament. This is the only one where he doesn't give such a commendation. Um, this salutation, though, is one that he uses in similar fashion. He does so in Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Ephesians, Philippians, and here in Galatians as well. If you were to go and look in those places, and I can see my time is almost up, um, then you can, you can go and look, and, and you can see uh, that he's got very similar verbiage in his greeting in, in those letters as well. Verse 3, I want to focus just on this for a moment. Grace to you and peace, he says. Let's just pick those two words out, shall we? Grace and peace. These are the two words that really should just jump forth from that verse for us. Grace is the source of salvation. Peace is the result of it. Or we can see it this way, that 
Grace is the sum of all blessings bestowed by God. Peace is the enjoyment of all blessings experienced by the believer. Look at verse 4. Who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Look at that. Who gave himself for our sins. This is grace. Why? To deliver us from this present evil age. That's peace. Paul has communicated that we are saved by grace, and what is the result? Peace. But more than just a relaxed feeling, we think of peace as kind of a serenity, right? More than just a relaxed feeling, it's God's peace. God's peace. So what does God's peace look like in spirit-filled Christians? What does that look like? Well, the scripture says that we have a peace that surpasses all understanding. It's almost incomprehensible, this sort of peace. It's an inner calm. It flows from within. It's not an outer calm that we can manufacture because of a diffuser that has some essential oils in it. That's not the peace we're talking about. We have a peace with God. We don't fear death. We don't fear what the world brings. We have no fear of Satan or of demons. We have no fear of whatever happens in life because we are at peace with God. That's the kind of peace we're driving at. We have a healthy confidence and we're eager to be in his presence. Isn't that something you desire right now? In this strange world, in which we live, to have a peace that surpasses all understanding, to have a peace that wells up from without, inside of one's soul, to have a peace that is because of the confidence that we know that God is in total and complete control. That's real peace. This is ultimate peace, and that's what grace from God brings. Paul's greeting of grace and peace is sourced from two persons, he says. Paul identifies both the Father and the Son in verse 3. From God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Just consider that for a moment. Paul is making very clear right here the harmony between the Father and the Son. As it was the Son who submitted to the Father's will by going to the cross for what purpose? To purchase our salvation. So the Father and the Son indeed are one. No question about that. Let's just pause for a moment and let's zero in on our main theme here, our big idea for today. Now, Jesus died for our sin really because of God's what? Grace. Absolutely, because of God's grace. Now, let's examine verse 4 and let's dig a little bit deeper here into this verse. Verse 4, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of God and uh, will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. We see where grace comes from and peace. It's because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul affirms that he, meaning our Lord, gave himself for our sins. In other words, he offered himself as a sacrifice for our sin. That's what Jesus anticipated in the garden, and that's what the Lord knew was coming. Now, this is very important for us to understand. Paul is serious about this. This is the essence of the gospel message right here. The death of Christ was not some kind of an act of love, and we leave it at that. It's not the death of a hero, and we suffice to say that it's that. Consider the, really the diminished value in something like that sort of a view. The death of Christ was sacrificial atonement for sin. In other words, the death of Christ reconciled the unreconcilable. Christ's crucifixion reconciled God and man 
through Christ's shed blood. Therefore, the death of Christ is an actual sacrifice for sin. It sounds elementary, and I suppose that it is, but it is at the heart of the gospel because you can't and you don't want to add anything else to that. Because Christ's work, listen, was sufficient. Now Christ is that one Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Paul will defend this gospel to the Judaizers. These are the false teachers within these churches. And he's going to say this later on in his letter. Circumcision adds nothing to that gospel message. Ceremony adds nothing to that message. Jewish ritual adds nothing to that message, or any other ritual for that matter. Morality adds nothing to that message. This is the truth of the gospel. And as believers, we should want to defend that truth, the authentic gospel of Jesus Christ, as Paul did. And therefore, we should take very seriously our present evil age. Verse 4, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. The word age, aeon in the Greek, used here means period of time. And Paul has in mind here the, the present period of time, his time. Now he views this time as evil. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, you can flip over there right quick. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16. Oh, sure, it's up there on the screens, but maybe you would enjoy turning there. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. We have a crack staff here, you know, who's capable of doing these things. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. Here's what it says. Look carefully, then, how you walk. You know what that says in the, the, the King James? Walk circumspectly. Circumspectly. Be aware of what's going on all around you. That's what it means. You just can't go on with, like, horse blinders, uh, uh, taking away your peripheral vision and looking just straight forward, not aware of what's going on all around you. He's saying, be aware. See what's happening all around you. Look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time. Why? <laughs> because the days are evil. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. So what was the evil in Paul's day? Well, let's turn over to Romans chapter 1, shall we? Romans chapter 1, we'll just get an idea. Verse 18, Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. See if you can identify any parallels. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. These are unregenerate people. They do not believe in the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And because of their unbelief, these things right here are manifest in their life. They suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. That's general revelation. You look all around here, you can see the evidence is clear. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So, so meaning unregenerate people, all of us, all of humanity is without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, 
and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forevermore. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient, as if the evil that is plain and easy to do isn't enough. You've got to invent better ones. Disobedient to parents. Notice how that is couched right in there in the midst of all the rest of those heinous crimes disobedient to parents kids take note disobedient to parents put right in there the rest of all those nasty sins that tells me that God thinks that obedience to parents is actually very important foolish faithless heartless ruthless though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die they not only do them but give approval to those who practice them. That is it right there. That's the Paul and that's the evil in Paul's day. The wrath of God was coming, denying the creator and suppressing the truth. They were given up to their own passions. They fell into depravity. They were filled with all sorts of unrighteousness. Paul would call this later on in his letter here in chapter 5 he would call this the works of the flesh those sins that are evident uh, to those not blinded by them evident sins sins unrepented of that will keep one out of the kingdom this is what Paul was talking about but there was also an evil that was tormenting the churches that he had planted These false teachers had come in, these Judaizers had come into these churches, and these men were distorting the gospel. They claimed to be Christians, understand that. They claimed to be Christians, but they altered that gospel's message, and they tried to draw Christians back into some elements of Judaism. That's why they were called Judaizers. And And Paul referenced them as such. Now, these Judaizers called themselves Christians, but they said that the work of Christ on the cross was insufficient. They said that there's got to be more to that, and here's what it is. They literally went into Paul's churches among Gentile men and said, "You, you, yeah, we we preach Christ crucified too, but you've got to be circumcised, you see. Now think about the irony in that. Gentile men, adult men, they have no notion of what the importance of circumcision is. And yet this is the the message that these Judaizers were trying to communicate to them. This was a false gospel. And there are plenty of false teachers in our day as well. Paul and the early Christians were living in an evil time and attacks against Christianity came from within those Galatian churches as well as from without. So I'm wondering, can we relate at all to Paul's message? Is there any evil in our day? Oh, come on. Of course there is. Sin is not viewed, it seems, with the same concern that it used to be. Why is that? Could it be that maybe sin is not as dangerous as it used to be? Could it be that sin is not as prevalent as it used to be? Maybe sin is just not as easy to identify as it once was. Listen, our American culture is very consistent with Romans chapter 1. Not only does it accept sin, it glorifies sin. How? 
How does that happen? Well, I'm glad that you asked. Uh, let me tell you. Secular humanism, absolutely embedded in our society. It says that humanity is capable of morality and self-fulfillment without belief in God. Want proof? Trying to teach kids right from wrong without any mention of God or his holy word, an absolute fallacy, lunacy, impossibility to have any sort of lasting impact with an approach such as that. Morality is good. Ethics, really good. But apart from God, who is the author of all such things, insane. What are you going to get with that? Behavior modification, I would submit to you, for a short period of time. Why? Because genuine change comes from within and is the result of a soul change. Evolution, clearly taught in our schools. But have you ever considered the subtle presentation of it on TV? Any mention of a, an old earth, anytime you hear the phrase millions of years, you and your children's ears should go, Ding! it should be antennae. You should listen for these phrases that give away the message of what's being communicated in something as simple as a kid's program. Pornography. I left with Eric Ludy yesterday, turned left, went down to the light, right, onto Route 80, traveled not two exits, and what is blasted in front of Eric's and my eyes, but a half-naked woman on a billboard that's the size of Texas. I'll tell you this, when I'm doing my research for messages such as this, and I'm using a program like Bible Gateway to copy and paste um, the, uh, the text from Galatians chapter 1 into my notes, I have a banner on the left side, and Cindy was in my office one time, and she was like, whoa, what are you looking at? I was like, I'm on Bible Gateway, look. What's it doing there? It's like just ever-present, it seems. Now, not ever-present because only God is ever-present, but you know what I'm talking about. It's almost like you can't escape it. I'm studying for my message, and I've got to close out a Bible gateway. Homosexuality. This is what that portion in Romans chapter 1 was talking about, where they exchanged the truth for a lie, and they gave up their... their uh, uh, gave themselves up to dishonorable passions, men and women exchanging the natural function of their bodies for unnatural functions. Talk about approval. How about the federal Supreme Court putting a stamp of approval and various states throughout our union approving of such practice with their laws and Supreme Court rulings that support such laws? drug abuse and the violence that comes with it, murder. Seems that within a threat of our society right now, it's acceptable or even justified to commit acts of violence against certain groups of people that might wear a blue uniform. Abortion, of course, is murder. We see fornication, adultery, divorce is rampant in our society. Hey, let's just get right to it. What's America's favorite city? Sin City. Las Vegas. That's what they call it. That's the nickname. We have a, a, a city that is nicknamed for pleasurable sin. Now, I don't mean to get all down on us here today. I, really, I don't. Because the next point, just wait, we're going to get there, actually has the, the resolution to this problem. <laughs> but this reflects a world that's impacted by humanism. It's impacted by evolution. It's impacted by selfishness. It's the natural behavior of unregenerate man. 
we almost shouldn't be surprised by all of this because that's what natural man tends, trends toward. How about the problem of Judaizers? Is this a problem in our churches today? I haven't run into any Judaizers. But false teaching is far too common today. The problem does exist in our churches. We don't name that false teaching of Judaizing among our concerns within the church, but some false teachers are over in their presentation of a gospel that doesn't jive with, with an orthodox or a, a true authentic gospel message according to the, the Bible and what Paul is saying. Now, some of these false teachers are over, and it's easy to detect errors in their doctrine, right? Faith versus works. There are those that say that it's faith plus works that results in salvation. We say that our works are an evidence of the genuine salvation that we have, which is by the grace of God and the, and the faith that we are enabled to have. How about the, the literal six-day creation versus figurative creation? It might be kind of hard to, to, uh, to detect that because the message might be somewhat subtle, but it's there. How about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, the charismatic movement, which takes the Holy Spirit and assigns to it certain things that are not intended necessarily for this day and age? I'd invite you to look at a really good book and read it by John MacArthur called Charismatic Chaos. How about the inerrancy of scripture? Listen, just one piece of God's word that you question and believe might not necessarily be truth calls into question the entirety of the whole canonized scripture that we have. These are not necessarily difficult errors to detect. You can, it's kind of in your face. Sometimes there are some, some difficulty in detecting, but generally speaking, they're over meaning um, they're easy to detect. But other false teachers are, are more subtle. And some megachurch preachers today, the, the common theme seems to be a disdain for the law. The law is intended to drive us to the cross of Jesus Christ. It shows us the inadequacy of our own self that we cannot manufacture our own salvation. There should be no disdain for the law. What did Jesus say? I have come to fulfill the law. That's what Frank read earlier today. Christ was the fulfillment of God's law. There's no, there's no competition between law and grace. In God's economy, they're like this. Perfectly blended together. Now, this history of a resentment for the law and a trending towards the opposite direction Either extreme being bad, the extreme position concerning grace, and the extreme position concerning the law. This, of course, was present in Paul's day. It resurfaced again later during the, the time of the, the Reformation. And in the Reformation, Martin Luther actually took two Greek words, he smashed them together, and uh, he, he used the word uh, anti and nomos, and he created this term called antinomianism. Now, anti means against, and nomos means law. Antinomians were literally in the Protestant Reformation against the law. Martin Luther believed that towards the tail end of the Reformation to try to preserve the integrity of the gospel message would send out people around the, uh, the, the city of Wittenberg in Germany, which is where Luther's 95 theses were tacked, wanting to make sure that a false gospel wasn't being propagated by these Protestant preachers. And so as they visited these churches, Luther wanted to know, he wanted to make sure that we didn't have wolves in sheep's clothing deceiving congregants, like was happening in Paul's day. And one of Luther's associates, his name was Agricola, had a problem with that. He said that, that really at salvation... We are accountable, but that's it. After that, we're free. And so accountability doesn't, it flies in the face of God's grace, he said. Luther was on fire against the Greek law, and he wrote a book against antinomianism and named his friend. <laughs> Listen, we're not freed from accountability upon salvation. That's not what it did for us. 
It's not legalism to recognize the value of, of the law in keeping us on track. The law's purpose is to bring conviction. The law's purpose is to bring repentance. The law's purpose, even after salvation, we still need to repent because we still are sinners. And the law's purpose is renewal as we're driven towards Christ. There's a delicate balance. And I said to Eric yesterday, I don't need to preach this message tomorrow. I ought to just pull up your session from today and just play it for the people. Because he was absolutely right in his explanation of the, of the coordination of these two principles. Listen, here's the bottom line. That we cannot pit God's law against God's grace. And many false teachers are teaching this distorted grace doctrine today. So why does this matter? Well, Paul's concern with the Galatians is, is just as relevant today as it was back then. The Judaizers were distorting the gospel by infusing their legalism, and the backlash against legalism is this disdain for the law and a warped view of God's grace. And this is why Paul wrote to be diligent to present yourselves a workman who does not need to be ashamed doing what? Rightly dividing the word of truth. Sinclair Ferguson wrote this. He said in his book, The Whole Christ, he articulated his concern regarding the relationship of law and grace. I thought this was good. He wrote that antinomianism and, and legalism are, quote, non-identical twins that emerge from the same womb. Antinomianism and legalism are not so much antithetical to each other as they are both antithetical to grace. And this is why scripture never prescribes one as the antidote for the other. Rather, grace God's grace in Christ and our union with Christ is the antidote to both. No, things aren't much different today than they were in Paul's day. Yet Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age. How can we stop the madness is the question. Well, it is the deliverance that the Lord provides. This is the good news. This is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is deliverance. We can see deliverance in three forms. I'm going to try to quickly go through this and wrap up. Deliverance from the guilt of sin, number one. We have deliverance from the guilt of sin. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 says that sin is a transgression of God's law. We violate it with sin. All have sinned, Paul said, Romans 3.23. All have sinned for, for which the punishment is what? Death. All have sinned. The punishment is death. Jesus' blood frees us from the guilt of our sin. And we receive the remission of sins when we are baptized. Now, that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Upon salvation, we are baptized with the Holy Spirit and we are commanded to be continually filled. That's called sanctification. In Jesus, there is no condemnation for sin. No condemnation. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. It says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. We also have a second mode of deliverance. That is deliverance from the power of sin. Deliverance from the power of sin. What does sin do? Flip over to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. 
The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And this he does by giving us the spirit. He gives us the spirit. We receive the spirit, like I said just a moment ago, when we are baptized by his Holy Spirit at conversion. And with the spirit's aid, we can put to death the deeds of the flesh. That's sanctification once again. We should be on a pathway towards growth. Can you manufacture that growth in your own flesh? No. This was the illustration that Frank reminded us that Eric told us about yesterday. I can remember vividly in my mind efforts to try to make myself, this is after salvation, make myself more righteous as I would try in my flesh to will myself to be better. Now, that's not to say that there is not a responsibility within the human being to put himself on that pathway towards continual renewal and repentance and growing in our relationship to the Lord. But the work of the Holy Spirit within us should produce a natural inclination to these things. And that's what we need to understand. Jesus teaches us <clears throat> that we are set free from the law of sin and death, and it is his work, finished work on the cross that does that. Finally, it's deliverance from the temptation of sin. So we have deliverance that comes in three modes. Deliverance from the guilt of sin. We have deliverance from the power of sin. We have deliverance from the temptation of sin. Does that mean we're not going to be tempted? Come on now. No. But we continue to be tempted by fleshly desires. So what is the answer there? He teaches us, Jesus does, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 41. He teaches us to watch and pray that we might avoid temptation. Look at, look at Matthew 26, verse 41. I think this is uh, really important for us. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. He was speaking that to his friends. As Jesus himself went to pray in the garden, he said, watch and pray. Watch, Keith. Watch, people of Calvary. And pray. Immerse yourself in God's word. Immerse yourself in communication together with him. When there's a void inside, something's going to come in and fill that void up. What is that going to be? You want to fill it up with the spirit of God or you want to fill it up with fleshly desires? You have two options. Jesus said that his father will not allow us to be tempted beyond that which we are able to bear. What a promise that is. Whenever you think that things are crashing down around you and you feel, and we've all said it before, I can't take it anymore. Well, just remember this verse. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Put out of your minds the fact that God is trying to tempt you, or, or that because God tempts no one, or that God is trying to test you to such a degree that you'll be broken. Well, in a sense, that's sort of true because he wants us to come to him broken. But the point here is, is that God is not going to allow us to be tempted beyond what we can bear because his grace is sufficient for you. In Jesus, the godly can find deliverance out of temptations. And in Jesus, we have the promise of deliverance from every evil work. If I could just wrap this up now. We live in a morally confused and spiritually dark world. But in the grace of Jesus, we find deliverance from the guilt of sin. We find deliverance from the power of sin. We find deliverance from the temptation of sin. 
And we note that such deliverance is, in verse 4, according to the will of our God and Father. It was his plan from the very beginning. In verses 3 through 6 of Ephesians chapter 1, it was his love that offered his son for our sins. So how should we respond to such deliverance? Well, when we are delivered, what should be the response? Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. Here's what it says. Ephesians 1, verse 6 says this, To the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. The response should be praise because of the glory of his grace. It's because of what God is doing in your life. Thus, Paul writes concerning God, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Should we not glorify God by accepting his graceful deliverance from this evil age that he makes possible through his son, Jesus Christ? And we do so through obedience to the gospel. Charles Spurgeon wrote this, which I thought was appropriate. Let me just close with this. Charles Spurgeon said, Repentance was never yet produced in any man's heart apart from the grace of God. Repentance was never yet produced in any man's heart apart from the grace of God. As soon may you expect the leopard to regret the blood with which its fangs are moistened. As soon might you expect the lion of the wood to abjure. That's a solemn renouncement. That's what abjure means, in case you don't know. As soon might you expect the lion of the wood to solemnly renounce his cruel tyranny over the feeble beasts of the plain, as expect the sinner to make any confession or offer any repentance that shall be accepted of God, unless grace shall first renew the heart. He has a tough way of writing, but here's the bottom line. It's the grace of God. It's the grace of God. It's the grace of God that shall first renew the heart. Now Spurgeon, as we now pivot into the remembrance of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself as the only sacrifice for sin. Spurgeon spoke of confession. That's the admission of sin. That's coming before a righteous holy God and saying, I'm a real knucklehead. I am indeed a sinner in need of your grace. Repentance, therefore, is the turning around and heading in the other direction. You say, I admit it. I'm a knucklehead. I want to head in the other direction. I want to move from here to here. See the grace of God for what it really is. What is it? It's an awesome demonstration of God's love. It was an incredible sacrificial atonement by the Lord Jesus Christ upon Calvary's tree. That was the only pathway to salvation. That's the essence of the gospel message. There is no way that we can be delivered from the madness of this world except because of the transforming power of the cross of Jesus Christ where his blood was shed, where it ran down and it washed away all of our sins. There's no other way. And there's nothing that we can add to it. That's what the word sufficient means. So we have this object lesson. Before Christ went to the cross, he gathered together with his disciples. And he said to them, and and I hope that you have your elements at this time, and you can take them. And so our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took that bread, and when he had given thanks, 
he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father in heaven, we thank you for sending to us your one and only Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who took on the body of a man, who lived a sinless and perfect life, who willingly submitted to his Father's will, going to the cross, allowing himself to be beaten beyond recognition. We thank you for that sacrifice. We thank you for subjecting yourself to the cross. We thank you that because of it, we have forgiveness of sin. For it's in Jesus' name who went to the cross that we pray these things. Amen. And so in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, and he said to them, his disciples, this cup... <clears throat> is the new covenant in my blood. He said, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for sending us your son, Jesus Christ, who because of his body that he submitted to cruelty of man, which resulted in his shed blood upon Calvary's tree that ran down it, washes us now, makes us white as snow. We thank you for that incredible sacrifice. We thank you, Father, for sending your son. We thank you for providing us a way out of the enslavement that we have to sin. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to work in each and every one of our lives, that we would be drawn closer to yourself, that it would be our innermost desire to know you more and more in our lives, that we would no longer be a slave to sin, but we would be slaves instead to righteousness. And we thank you for the righteousness that was imputed to us because of Jesus' work on the cross. So to this end, Father, we just want to praise and thank you and give you all of the glory that you have indeed given us a way of escape. Thank you for delivering us from ourselves. For it is in Jesus' precious name we pray and ask these things. Amen.